Hey guys, welcome back to another Honkai Star Oil video. Version 1.2 is already out, and continuing in the direction of flushing out every player's roster, we're finally getting our first widely accessible destruction unit, Blade. You can feel the edge oozing out from him, it's awesome. On a side note, I really appreciate how Star Rail is going about its initial lineup of 5 stars. The selection we had in version 1 is a very thorough one. Kyra, Branya, Bailu, Jepard, Yanqing, Welt, and Himeko cover a lot of bases, but this is offset by the difficulty in attaining them, as unless you make the rather ill-advised choice to weigh on the standard banner, trying to get even one of them will cost a pretty penny, let alone two or more. So it's nice that the first wave of event banners, Sila, Jingyuan, Silverwolf, Luo Cha, and now Blade, are also specialists in different fields, as it takes into account players who are in need of members of different elements and paths. Anyways, Blade will not only be the first win 5 star character widely accessible, but the first destruction unit as well, and after taking a look at his design, he thankfully presented a solution to a concern I had regarding DPS units. In fact, it was so well thought out that I think he's a perfect example of good DPS design. Someone who, in the right circumstances, can output phenomenal pressure on par with even the best of the best without encroaching on anyone else. Moreover, I love how he highlights other situational characters, further expanding on the degree of planning and team building in this scheme. So without further ado, let's talk about it. See, a point of contention within Genshin is that generally, situational characters performed worse than all-purpose ones because the structure of his combat almost punished them for deviating away from the status quo, even if it was executed on well. I was concerned that the same would apply in Star Rail, especially with how streamlined and oversimplified the game's combat was. For a long time, I was trying to figure out what would happen for DPS. When Sila came out, she was beyond overpowered. Her enormous damage ceiling coupled with her ability to double both as a single target killer and a mob killer by virtue of her recent mechanics set quite the standard for the first feature 5 star character. Coupled that with how much further the current list of supports can amplify her strength, and it became very clear that for the foreseeable future, the meta will primarily consist of a team of 1 DPS, 1 tank, and 2 supports, usually a healer and a buff or debuff type character. But with how strong she was, I thought the only way another DPS could stand out is if they were just flat out better than her, raising the question of power creep, so I wasn't sure how good of a cell blade would be. In addition, destruction is still a very ambiguous and unexplored path in Star Rail. Between the three damaging paths, it's supposed to revolve around both offense and defense, single target and multi-target alike, giving off the impression that its members would be jack of all trades, masters of none. In gacha games especially, you can only really stand out by either being the best option at something or the only option at something. It wasn't clear what kind of job, quote unquote, the path would fulfill. How does this pressure differ from Hunt being single target and Erudition being multi-target? Needless to say, there were a lot of questions I had before looking at Blade, which made it all the more pleasantly surprising to see how well he was designed. His playstyle is based on inflicting self-damage to deal damage, a very divisive archetype in the RPG world, but a frequent one. The idea is to play around risk and reward. At the cost of putting yourself in danger, you can deal impressive amounts of damage. His skill consumes a portion of his max HP to apply a self-buff, where for the next few turns he deals bonus damage and empowers his basic attack. While in this state, basic attacks consume a tenth of his max health and deal wind damage equal to the sum of a portion of his attack and max HP to the primary target and a smaller amount to nearby ones. He essentially has a passive AoE attack. This alone should tell you exactly how to build him. Curiously, using a skill doesn't end his turn, meaning you can use Hellscape and then lead into your normal attack, which is pretty convenient since using a turn to buff yourself, then having to wait a full cycle to make use of that buff is a bit inefficient. When I first saw this interaction, I was like, wait, he's completely self-sufficient skill point-wise, but unfortunately, I found out his empowered basic attack doesn't generate a skill point as it's counted as part of his skill. His ultimate follows suit, setting his current HP to 50% of his total health and dealing a burst of wind damage to a single target equal to a portion of his attack and max HP just like his normal attack, in addition to, and get this, a portion of the total HP he lost in the current battle. Half of that damage is also applied to adjacent targets. Now it's important to make note, there is a cap to the lost HP thing, capping out at 90% of his max health, so you can't infinitely damage Blade over and over for infinite damage, although it would be kind of fun to allow that. One more thing, after using his ultimate, that lost health counter is reset to zero. You'll have to wait a while before using his ultimate again, even if it's available. He gives off the same vibe as Utah, doesn't he? HP scaling and self-damage. Ignoring the numbers for a moment, Blade paints a clear picture. He's gonna be somewhat high maintenance, not in terms of investment per se, but in team assistance. He has a modicum of self-healing, which I'll get into momentarily, but the self-inflicted damage will obviously need to be monitored carefully, since though he can't outright kill himself with a skill or normal attack, dropping down to 1 HP means even a small bit of dot damage or the enemy attack will wipe him out. Case in point, external healing of some sort is a must. You know, we just had a character the version prior with the ability to regenerate his teammates every time they attack. How convenient, if not ostentatiously so. If you thought that was just coincidence, take a look at his talent. Whenever his HP drops, he gains a stack of charge. Upon capping out of 5, he automatically deals wind damage as a follow-up with the same attack and health dual scaling as his other moves before healing for a quarter of his max health. 
Don't let the self healing fool you though, it's nowhere near sufficient for you to forego a healer. Even if he took less than 25% max health from enemy attacks, he hurts himself way more than his talent can actually heal. It's the follow-up damage that matters more, because it actually deals more damage than his ultimate if we don't count that lost HP accumulation, especially when taking into account the fact that he damages all enemies, not just one or even three. This guy almost sounds like an erudition unit at this point. Wrapping things up with this technique, it's an overworld attack that consumes a portion of his health to deal wind damage to all enemies upon entering combat based on his max health. As for his traces, they're all geared towards making it easier for him to do his job more comfortably. First trace gives him bonus incoming healing when under half health, and remember, his ultimate puts him right at that spot. Second trace causes his basic attack to heal for roughly half the cost to use it if the attack weakness breaks, which is somewhat helpful, although I feel like it wouldn't have hurt to just fully refund the cost. And the final trace amplifies the attack from his talent by 20%. Not gonna lie, when I saw all the restrictions in his kit such as the empowered basic attack, not generating a skill point, or his ultimate having a cap, I thought they were being a bit too harsh on him, but I can understand why. Blade has immense damage potential, which he rightfully should given the danger he puts himself into access it, and with those concessions he would be a bit too overpowered. Calling back to what I said about his design at the beginning of the video, this is exactly what I meant. Granted, I've only tested him for a short time and don't have the empirical data to make a conclusive statement, but I very much enjoy how they conceptualized him. Based on surface level theoreticals, Blade's damage dealing can match or in rare cases exceed Zeela's, who is at present far and away the best damage dealer in the game. His base numbers are really good, and being a destruction unit, he can lay down equal punishment against one enemy or several. Prior to him, it was almost impossible for anyone to keep up with Sila, as anyone who could contest her damage against single targets like, say, Yan Ting, doesn't share her ability for AoE clearing and vice versa. Ching Yuan probably still beats her against big waves of enemies, but versus one opponent, he's outclassed. Blade might be the first damage dealer who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with their versus bosses or groups alike, while at the same time doing so in his own distinguished way that doesn't sacrifice practicality. Self-damaging is quite literally a double-edged sword, as you damage yourself to damage your opponent. But we just had Lo Cha, whose playstyle harmonizes with Blade really well. That being said, Bailu can still be just as effective since healing is healing, and a revived passive can also help you out on the off chance he accidentally dies. On top of that, like Sila, Blade pairs pretty well with the current meta supports like Silverwolf and especially Branya, although Branya is just friggin' busted in general with the sheer buffing capabilities, not to mention her turn reset skill which is a godsend in a turn-based RPG. Since he is more situational than Sila, the latter will likely be easier to use, but Blade has one thing that she doesn't. He's very skill point efficient, even though the empowered auto attack doesn't generate any SP, he only needs one every three turn cycles. This grants him the possibility of serving as a sub DPS, or in other words, he doesn't always need to be the hyper carry. Ideally, he's at his best when you are pulling resources into him, such as using Branya's turn refresh on him to rack up more stacks of charge and deal more damage overall, but the option to have him accompany your existing team for supplementary damage is also there. That flexibility will come in handy for long term viability. Essentially, provided my number estimates are correct, Blade will be just as strong as Sila, or in some cases, more given the right investment, but his situational nature keeps him from being infinitely better in every circumstance, and that's why I love his design so much. They found a way to make a character with comparable strength to Sila without blatantly stepping over her or power creeping the game. Moreover, how he executes on his game plan feels pretty good. Oftentimes you have characters with a lot of power and potential, but trying to tap into it feels too inconsistent or inefficient. For example, Qingche can be a very destructive hyper carry with a lot of investment, but the number of hoops you have to jump through is a little more than what some people are comfortable with, whereas Blade is comparatively easier to use, just like Sila, albeit a bit more situational, though not enough to compromise the range of use cases. I think it really has to do with skill point economy. With the game having been out for roughly 3 months, resource management became a focal point of Star Wars combat. The fact that Blade explicitly requires a healer to sustain himself might be a negative compared to Sila who can use either a healer or tank, but at the same time Blade is more economical SP wise compared to Sila. Both units have their strengths and weaknesses. Plus, we still need another all-purpose damage dealer for Memory of Chaos, and barring Branya, who let's be honest is only Wind Element by name, the current Wind units are kind of meh, so Blade kills two birds with one stone. All in all, I'm really looking forward to him. I hope Mihoyo continues finding inventive character designs that don't sacrifice practicality. I'm also a huge fan of this type of design. The whole concept of self-damage to deal damage as a high-risk, high-reward playstyle is pretty fun to work with. I'm personally looking forward to Destruction because it's a good mixture of single and multi-target damage and I prioritize coverage, but that's just me. At worst, he's a good character. I really don't see him being a mediocre one. At best, he's a top-tier damage dealer that covers a lot of bases, so anyone interested in pulling for him will not be disappointed. Although, Kafka's around the corner, so uh, yeah, rip in pieces wallet. Anyways, that's gonna be it for today. Let me know your thoughts on Blade in the comments down below, whether you plan to get him or not. But as always, if you enjoyed the video, it would be great if you left a like and subscribe. 
Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Varsvarum, join my Discord server, and check out my other Star Wars character videos if you haven't yet. For now though, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.